Sweetheart of Swing. Welcome to Stay Tuned, the show for animation lovers, recorded live on YouTube and proudly streaming on Patreon. Coming to you from Austin, Texas, I'm your host, Phil Maki. Thank you so much for joining me this evening on the Super Blood Wolf Moon. Arrgh! Tonight, Stay Tuned continues its closer look at the members of Dynamic Music Partners with part two of this three-part music series. Christopher Carter is here. All that, and you'll have a chance to share your thoughts, questions, and opinions with me for a live Q&A after the show. My special guest tonight has been nominated for multiple Annie Awards and Emmys, together with Lolita Ritmanis, Michael McQuistian, and Shirley Walker, he helped bring home a daytime Emmy for Batman Beyond. His journey into the DC animated universe started at the young age of just 22 when he joined the creative team for Batman the Animated Series. Representing one third of Dynamic Music Partners, Christopher Carter is here to compose some geekery with me in just a few moments. But first, this. Welcome to Stay Tuned. Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Together with your partners, Lolita Ritmanis and Michael uh, McQuistian, you make up Dynamic Music Partners. How did the decision yeah. to form that group come about? And perhaps more importantly, do you have psychic superpowers, the three of you together? <laughs> I'd liken it more to the married couple that finishes each other's sentence after 20-something years. Did I say it was really that long? It really wasn't that long because we, we must have met each other in elementary school, I think, because it can't have been 20 years, but it has been 20 years. Oh. <laughs> and um, all of us began our careers under Shirley Walker, who was the supervising composer of Batman the Animated Series and so much more. She was a phenomenal mentor, and she, she, she wanted to use her position in the industry to help young composers get started. And it, we were so grateful for her uh, wanting to help us. And um, ultimately, we reached the point that she needed, needed to kind of push us out of the nest, so to speak. And when we were uh, flapping our wings frantically on the way down out of the nest... <laughs> We realized, you know, we're going to end up competing against each other for the same jobs. We like each other. We're compatible. But most importantly, we, re we realized that as a team, there's some quality of life that we could have. The film industry will completely eat you up if you allow it in terms of, you know, ridiculous deadlines and crazy stressful schedules. And we realized that the three of us together could be this kind of, you know, immutable force. Sure. That we could face the industry, build each other up and still have a life. <laughs> Having a good work balance, being able to see our families, being able to sleep and eat and take care of our bodies are the ways that we wanted to try and, and meet this this challenge of a, in more of a marathon style than a sprint. Like a musical tripod. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> but, but not at all like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> Do you write differently when you're writing as a solo artist? Like in the same way that a choir tries to sing with blended voices, do you have to write music as a blended trinity? 
That's a really good question. I, I think a lot of people at first were kind of confused how we could do that, how we could actually write a project. Um, absolutely. I think to take us individually, we do each have our own individual things that we do, our own sound, things that we like to gravitate towards, different kinds of projects, different kinds of ways to construct music just on a really basic level of how you hear the, the colors. But our job to, collectively is to serve the project. We have to come up with a sound that at the end of the day is homogenous and cohesive. And so, yeah, I think that we all just side together with the producers of what the sound's going to be, and then we just adjust what we need to do in our individual voices to have it all come together in that way. I see. Okay. I imagine you've come to be quite familiar with the styles of your partners, but also yourself as a result of writing together. Yes and no. There'll be this this shock where we're maybe putting together a soundtrack or a, a CD or a submission, and we'll go back into the archives and listen to our old music, and there will honestly be times that we'll look at each other going, oh my god, I have no idea who wrote that piece of music. Oh wait, you mean it's me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes we can't even recognize our own writing. Okay. Um, I do think that it gets hard to tell, and and that's good for the for the project too, is to come away not being obvious right away who did what. And sure. in fact, it's kind of uh, fun. I think some of our producers, like you know Bruce Tim or James Tucker, they love to sit there and kind of say, "Oh, did Michael write this?" Lolita wrote that. Okay, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. There's times where I was where I felt like, okay, I think I know who wrote this after listening to a few. But then there would be times where I would not look at the screen and the track name, and I would go, ah, oh, betcha so and so wrote this, and I was wrong. And that was kind of a cool thing because I'm like, all right, well, clearly they are succeeding and throwing me off now. But it seemed to me, if I had to put a little bit bit of a finger on your style, that maybe you have more electronic roots in what you do is that a fair statement gosh i i think i had maybe a little bit more of a of a rock influence oh, okay. um from high school through college when i really became interested in composing i had this kind of duality in my personality because i was definitely interested in classical music and conducting and orchestras and all these traditional instrumentation and then i also like most high schoolers was determined to be the next big rock star <laughs> of course i played in a rock, I played in a rock <laughs> band and we were gonna go off and make it big and of yeah. course that didn't happen like it doesn't most of the time <laughs> <laughs> wait now i have to know but, what, what was the name of your band i have to know the name of our band was Trist. T-R-Y-S-T. Oh, oh yeah, like a like a romantic and, tryst in the woods. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and people, not everybody know what that means. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, it actually means something too. But <laughs> <laughs> nice. but yeah, we we did write our own songs. We played in the. Uh, I went to school in the Dallas area, so we played oh. in the Dallas heavy metal club scene. You know, among all the other original bands there, and and it was it was really really cool. But by the time I came to Hollywood, then I did have this classical music degree and experience in conducting and playing orchestras, but then. I also had, you know, rock music. And I think that kind of bled over because I was the keyboardist uh, into kind of really uh, being into, you know, electronica and, and synthesis and and uh, unusual sounds and sound design. And yeah, that's something that's really kind of piqued my interest over the years. And, and actually, as we've come more into the recent times, um, I've actually been following that passion in uh, to a new electronic music project, which if we have time to talk about it, I'd love yeah, to of course, a little bit. Of course. So who are, you, <laughs> who are your influences then? If you have orchestral and some rock influences, who inspired you? You to go that direction um i from the orchestral side was totally into like 18th and that or well 19th century composers the, the 1800s sure sure um a lot of people from russia like late late period um stravinsky and shostakovich and okay. uh prokofiev and Mahler and Strauss and all this, you know, when sometimes when people that aren't necessarily musicians think of classical music, they think of something that's really light and peaceful. And I'm like, no, <laughs> classical music is epic. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, you gotta you gotta think the intense. the planets, right? Totally. Yeah. yeah. Oh and, yeah. The, and the rite of spring. Exactly. And um, all that really, really gets me going. I just I love that kind of really passionate music that, with an orchestra that just kind of it's soaring. And, and um, that's very much of an inspiration. And it's great that I've kind of ended up in superhero scoring because that kind of energy. Absolutely. It, it's kind of appropriate. <laughs> it's, it's very appropriate. It's you, you get to hit all the notes. You get to hit some nice, real dark subtleties and some disturbing yeah. things, and then you can you can go grandiose. Yeah, absolutely. And then as I, I got my degree in, in contemporary music, uh, in classical contemporary classical music, I did study a lot of avant garde music in the 20th century. Really weird stuff. Some of which I'm glad is not popular, but a lot of which <laughs> really <laughs> really uh, piqued my interest. I, I love you know Miss Missan, and um, I love. George Crumb, and I love uh, Yannis Zanakis, and I'm screwing up the names, but a lot of really cool contemporary composers that their music is very dissonant and very unsettling. And in some of my own work outside of 
dynamic music partners where I've done horror films, it's actually totally appropriate for this kind of using the orchestra in a in a sound design kind of way. Sure. But sure. then I was also really into Nine Inch Nails and oh, Rob okay. Zombie. Yeah. And really heavy heavy stuff, uh, t- heavy your heavier te- guitar based and kind of techno things. And that when we did Batman Beyond, ended up being a really cool mix to kind of draw in those influences as well. Sure, and that's and that's of course the the work that uh, the three of you and Shirley uh, won the Emmy for the daytime Emmy for, correct? Yes. Like, how does that work when you win an Emmy for a show? Is it they listen to a bunch of episodes or? Um, the Emmy's actually given to the series. So it's more, you know, you have to submit things for the judges to review. Okay. But the Emmy really is to celebrate the entire body of work of a series. And so it was very, very exciting to be honored in that way. But does that mean somebody from the Academy is like listening to like all 60 episodes of something or is it more like? No, you have to submit uh, something that you think represents what the series is about. Okay. And so we did submit um an episode that was what people reviewed in the in the judging. So when writing only single episodes for a series like the Zeta Project, for example, how concerned are you in matching the existing series tone? Oh, very. Yeah, very, very concerned. Again, we want people, I think, especially because there's three of us, we want people to not necessarily think that there's three composers. We want the show to just have the same musical feel. So absolutely, we're paying attention to what we each have created. Most of the time now, we're writing episodes together. We're not actually writing the individual pieces of music together, but, you know, I'll do one third of the music that has to be written for this episode, and Michael will do one third, and Lolita will do one third. And as we're creating that music, we're actually sharing with each other, you know, rough demos of this so we can hear how things are, are progressing. And when my music starts, like it can kind of feather, you know, dovetail out of their piece in, in, a, in an elegant way. And uh, so, awesome. yeah, there's definitely a lot of communication and coordination and making sure that we're all following the direction of the show that we've, we're taking. I imagine that your communication between the, the two of them uh, is now very, very much a second and third voice in your head when you're writing. It really is. But, you know, actually, there there was a time when we were working on Teen Titans yeah. that we did each do the, the shows individually. And those actually were very unique. Each show is unique because that was that came from the mandate of the producer, Glenn Murakami. In fact, he wouldn't even tell us what he liked because he didn't want us to keep doing it. He wanted each show to have its own feel and not necessarily draw upon anything in the past. And so that was one of the, the initial conversations. We'd sit down and we watched this episode individually with Glenn and we just start throwing weird things out. Uh, I I was so passionate about the character arc of Tara in Teen Titans. Absolutely, yeah. And when her episodes came up, I kind of fought tooth and nail. I must do the Tara oh, wow. episodes. But her initial uh, episode, the score with Glenn was like, you know, well, let's have Tara's sound be something that's kind of like Celtic music mixed with indie rock with country because she's kind of earthy and dance music. And so there's like a dance bass, oh. you know, uh, this kind of dance beat underneath guitar and penny whistles. And every single episode had that same level of just kind of brainstorming of just how weird can we take this? Now, is that because you already had a prior knowledge of Tara as a character or like what drew you to no. her? I just fell in love with the way Glenn wanted to tell that particular story. And of course, I mean, I, I know that all these stories came from the comics. Sure, At, at of least course. their inspiration, their genesis, you know, the, the whole Judas contract and everything. But yeah. I just fell in love with that story arc. And um, it was really nice that the rotations worked out that I got to do all of her episodes. So because so much of this stuff you guys are writing is from the comics, how often do you, uh, you know, have an issue of, let's say, Teen Titans right on your desk as a source of inspiration? Rarely. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love the characters, but I came into the whole comics world more from the movies and the cartoons, which I guess would have been Super Friends, which I I don't know how people. I mean, Man, I, I, Super Friends. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. Yeah, um, but that's it, a whole other story. Kind of my, it, that was my introduction to a lot of the characters, and of course the you know the live action movies. Sure. And sure. Um, the Batman the animated series, which I can't you know I was watching that in college. I graduated from college and started working on that show, and that was really kind of how I got in depth into those stories. But it was more from you know watching the shows and talking with the producers because the producers themselves are complete encyclopedias of those things. Glenn and sure. James Tucker and Bruce Tim, they have such a deep knowledge of these characters. And I actually found it mostly instructive to be able to just talk with them about how they felt about it. And because as film composers, we're really trying to tell the director or producer's story. That's really primarily needs to be our inspiration is the current iteration of that character or that story, that series, what the producer is trying to do that's unique and, and kind of their own personal take on it is what we need to, to try and, and write music to support. 
That makes absolute sense, yes. So when you're writing music for the same characters over different projects, do you find that you have to try and not copy your previous efforts for those characters? Like if you're going to write a Batman story, do you find that you have to go and purposely not do what you would think you would do for Batman? You know what I mean? And yes, because we actually have written quite a few versions of Batman. (laughs) We really have. Yeah. And um, I'd like to think that they're all kind of unique takes. And so certainly we're aware of what we've done in the past. But I really think it's less about trying to avoid it as a more of, you know, we have so many ideas that we can apply. Oh, isn't this exciting that now we get to kind of look to some new inspirations and some new ideas and let's go ahead and do something new that um, is actually really exciting to get a chance to write. That's cool. So you, you know, kind of write a new musical take on it. It's like you're kind of building on top of what you did before then. Sure. That's cool. You know, build, building on top of and building sideways. I mean, you know, we, we did this, we built this building, it's built, and now we get to go to the lot, uh, you know, the adjacent lot and, and start from the ground floor. And that, I, I think that's really, really exciting and inspiring. That's awesome. There's this belief in composing that the music shouldn't stand out too much from what you're seeing on screen, that it should be supportive of the visuals and never overshadow. There's got to be like a happy medium though, right? Because you don't want it to be so nondescript that it's forgettable either because a good theme, I think, can make a film project even more memorable. Totally. I definitely am of the opinion, the opposite opinion that um, you should be able to appreciate the music in, in the show. Um, I think if it's if something is not skillfully scored, if the music is fighting the story that's trying to be told, it is going to stand out in that sense of if you have music that's really not very well crafted to the scene, you know, sure, that's not going to be a great use of that music. But the opportunity to write music that lives and breathes on its own and has its own life and its own, um, you know, thing that will make be memorable to it. I think that's that's really the best film music that you can take away and enjoy as great music. But if it's been crafted from the point of it's telling the story that needs to be told and, you know, it's kind of married with the visuals, I don't think that it will stick out, but you still might notice it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but I, I, there's I totally get what you're saying. Yeah, the, like let's take I don't know, let's go off the animation path for just a second. Uh have you seen Westworld? The HBO one? Yeah. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so so the, that's all right. The guy that did the music for Westworld is uh same guy that did Game of Thrones. Oh, Ramin Jawadi. Yes. You look at what he's doing and and you could argue that it's supporting it, but it absolutely has this flair. Like he went out of his way to bring a player piano into that score. Uh-huh. And it's a story about the old West. And so because right. he, he chose that specifically, you know, he didn't have to choose that. He could have written music that would have supported what was on screen, but because he mm-hmm. added that extra flair to it, it just enhanced the story that much more. So, I mean, I imagine yeah. you guys are doing the same thing. You're trying to find a way to be supportive and at the same time, make the music stand out on its own two feet. That's definitely what we set out to do. Um, We would like to write music that is saying something that has a meaning for being there. We really resist against music that you might term wallpaper, where it's just kind of holding a tone. That's Um, what I mean. There you go. Yeah, we don't want to write musical wallpaper. And Uh, we want to write music that has a a purpose for beginning and a purpose for being in and a purpose to end. And then you have a piece of music that actually means something. And if you're not cognizant of what the music's doing, then, yeah, it can just become this kind of tone wallpaper. And and, uh, that's that's not fun. (laughs) No. Is it easy to fall into that trap, though, of of writing wallpaper music? Is that like an easy thing for people to just happen to do? Well, I can only speak about the music that I write. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't think I, uh, I don't. I, I want to write music that, that hopefully uh, means something. So I really sure. try to imbue some meaning into that, you know, the, the music that is accompanying cool. the scene. You know, there's some times that you do need music, but the scene is so delicate, you really do have to kind of put kid gloves on. But even in that sense, I try not to have it be wallpaper. I really try to have there okay. be, you know, some kind of a, a, of a line or a contour or a, a shift in color. Something that still matches the scene, but again, just stays way out of the way so that you don't, again, cross that line into being so overwrought that it it pulls you out of the moment. That's awesome. Young Justice just started back up again. Which yes, it is did. So exciting. It's, uh, we're we're thrilled. I I don't know of another show that's been able to come back in the way that Young Justice did, and it is entirely due to the passion of the fans. Yeah, 
and their you know letter writing campaign and Warner Brothers seeing that the demand for that show is out there. And uh, you know the producers, Greg Weissman and, and Brandon Vietti, have so many amazing stories to tell. I couldn't be more thrilled that they're getting to tell it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I have to say, from what I've watched so far, it literally feels like there was no gap in between. It is a well-oiled machine, the way that they've picked up where they left off. Totally. Yeah. I think that's pr- partly from their skill as, as writers and producers. I mean, they're just they're really amazing storytellers. And sure. they, 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 they got the band back together. You they know? did. And we're all working on our next album, and it's great. What's your favorite thing about returning to Young Justice? The stories. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm totally a fan of the shows that I've been privileged to work on. And I think that any time I get to start a new episode, there, I always get this little fanboy rush of, I'm the first one to see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not that I can tell anybody about it, but there's a, excite, cool. you know, there's a rush of excitement that I feel about getting to see the next chapter. And I felt the same thing. We worked with Greg Weissman on The Spectacular Spider-Man also. He just creates really deep, complex stories that can carry on for seasons and seasons. And, you know, I, I think that fans are going to be just blown away at where they take the characters in this season. You won't believe what happens. Click to find out more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clickbait aside, um, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I love the, the way they, they tell the story. And it, I'm always inspired. Every time I watch a new episode, it, composing is hard work. There's no question about it. You really have to spend time and get into a mindset and you can't let things like uh, you know writer's block get in the way you got to get the music done but i find that working on young justice i'm so inspired by the story they're telling it does seem to flow just a little bit easier oh that's awesome that is so cool to hear so you created the music for uh one of in my opinion one of the darkest and most memorable entries in the animated batman universe which is return of the joker darker than the killing joke you know, it's not darker than The Killing Joke, but it's the tone of Return of the Joker, because at that point in time, there was nothing like Killing Joke to compare it to, I think. True. Animation-wise. So I guess you're right. The Killing Joke is absolutely super dark, but Return of the Joker left a thumbprint on my mind because of when it came out. It was just, that was like the bar, you know? It was dark. There's no question about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So how much of that project was influenced by the work that came before and how much was just straight up invention? Uh, previous Batman projects? Yeah. Like, like uh, how, how much of, how much? Not much. No, okay. I mean, it was set in the Batman Beyond TV series universe. And so it was really connected to that and telling the story that they had wanted. I mean, the biggest thing about that in terms of building for that movie that we didn't get to do before was in, um, in the production of the music. The original series was very guitar heavy. And just from the, the limitations that we had with the scoring resources, we pretty much just had guitars and synthesizers and drums. And we had, you know, a, a lot of uh, days of recording and overdubbing and more like making a, 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 a rock record than oh, okay. a typical score like Batman the animated series we just we, we would record an episode in, ha- in uh, three hours at a scoring stage with an orchestra Batman Beyond was much more record production in a studio but because the return of the Joker had the, the time frame that the flashback that goes back to the Batman the animated series timeline we knew we we're going to have an orchestra and so Shirley did not directly supervise that but I definitely was running things past where I was able to conceive of not just this record sound with the guitars and we actually had my guitars had like three Marshall amps and it was completely rocking shaking the walls of the studio <laughs> and uh, drums and everything else, but we also had a 60-piece orchestra that I had several uh, days to work with, and yeah. being able to put all of that together, rock and orchestra, it just became this gigantic, massive wall of sound. It was really thrilling. So because of your rock, you know, your passion for rock music, did Batman Beyond kind of spark more inspiration for you then? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely brought my kind of late 90s heavy metal rock ear. <laughs> That's what I was into at, that, at the time that it, it came out. I asked Lolita this question, and so I'm not going to tell you what she said, so I, I want to know what you say. Do you have a favorite character to write for? Like, when you see it, that there's a, a character that's going to be in an upcoming, either an episode or a, a direct-to-video film, do you get a little bit more excited about this character than anybody else? Ah. Uh. We get variations of this question sometimes. Oh, okay. But this is, this. I like this version. Usually it's, who's your favorite character? And well, that's that's a little bit, yeah, because see, I, having a favorite character is one thing, but but feeling like you can, you are excited to make the voice of that character might be a different yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, that's really hard to kind of sit down and, and distill down 20-something years of superhero cartoons, which <laughs> <laughs> one has been most exciting to write yeah, for. Yeah, no pressure. Um, just, just, you know... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, again, even though my, my main uh, 
Yeah, favorite person to write for. Whenever a new episode come up, I definitely know that when I was working on uh, Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, I was really into the arcs that featured Wonder Woman, Diana. Oh, cool. Um, A lot of the themes that Shirley had established in either Batman the Animated Series or Superman, we brought over into Justice League. So Superman theme, the Batman theme, those were all Shirley's. But as we got to get into other characters of the Justice League, we got to create our own themes for them. And Diana was one of the themes that I had the chance to do the first big theme for. And I, I don't know, again, she, it's just something about her strength and her grace and her duality of being this, you know, beautiful but very powerful woman. And, you know, I was inspired by by Shirley and Lolita and I, honestly, wow. powerful women in my life that, you know, helped shape that music. So, yeah, anytime that a Wonder Woman episode came around, I really, really enjoyed that. That's really awesome. That's now, I guess, follow up question. Do you get a little bit protective, like when Hans Zimmer's theme for for, <laughs> for Gal Wonder Gadot? Woman. Yeah, for Wonder Woman, when that was created, did you hear that and go, yeah, I guess that works? <laughs> <laughs> I love that theme. It's um, good. It's a good Again, theme. we're talking like kind of musical geekery. Um, yeah. It's an odd meter. It's not an even pulse of, you know, one, two, three, four. It actually has this kind of shuffle beat, you know, yes. like extra catch to it. There's if you It has an unusual rhythm to it. Is that a syncopation? It is kind of a syncopation. It's not a regular beat, but in my electronic music that I've been exploring recently, I've been doing remixes of certain things. And I actually have done a dance floor techno remix mix of the Wonder Woman, Hans Zimmer's Wonder Woman theme, where oh. it totally has this kind of regular drum beat that you can dance to in the clubs. So, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I really want to hear that. That is, that sounds <laughs> I'm hoping it'll, I, I had my first DJ set with my electronic project, which is called the KR Protocol at uh, a comic festival in Minneapolis called Convergence. And yes, I've heard was, of it. It went over, I thought, pretty well. And I'm hoping to get around to some of the other festivals and start doing some more DJing. But I, that's what I want to do is, is present, in addition to whatever kind of dance stuff people are used to dancing to, uh, remixes of things from the film score world and from the concert world, remixed with electronic beats that uh, totally fit side by side alongside you know your regular club sound. That is really cool. As nerd cool as you can get. That's a great combination of elements. I, I think people were very uh, surprised when they heard it. They're like, that's the Wonder Woman theme and I'm dancing. <laughs> you know? Wow. It was cool. So no, I, I didn't. At this point, by the time Hans Zimmer wrote the Wonder, Wonder Woman theme, you got to understand, I mean, Danny Elfman did the original Batman movie in 90 something. I'm a- blanking 89, on 89, 89, 89. I was going to say 87, 89. So, you know, there have already been a lot of different takes on superhero themes. Everybody's been doing their own versions of, of the theme. So at this point, it's just like, I think it's great that, that he's doing something that's unique in his own you know that people re- will definitely remember it too i just love the fact that all these beloved characters are getting such great musical treatment absolutely you said you wanted to talk a little bit about your current electronic project was that the thing you were just telling me about yes okay yes i recently decided to kind of focus more i mean we're all music producers in a way because we're producing electronic music and i finally decided you know i'd like to try and expand some of that into something that's a little more personal apart from my work with dynamic music partners and we each have our own film scores that we do, but I just wanted to write some music that, you know, can tell a story in the way that we do in a kind of a cinematic fashion, but not have any any film. But I'd like people to listen to it and say, you know, have them imagine stories in their head. And I, I just, I'm really into dance music. I'm really into techno and okay. electronica and EDM and dubstep. And I said, you know, this is what I, this is where I think I'd like to kind of put my infinite amounts of spare time. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Which I don't have, I don't have a lot. But, yes. But um, I did at uh, Convergence this last year, I did release an EP that's called Activate. And there's four songs on it. All right. And uh, two, two of the songs have vocals and two of them don't. And one of the vocalists actually is Josh Keaton, who is the animated voice of uh, the spectacular Spider. Spider-Man. Ah. And he's also the voice of, and I'm blanking on his character name, but the main voice in uh, Voltron right now, Dreamers Voltron. Oh, okay. Shiro. And he's a fabulous singer. And, you know, who better than a voice actor to kind of bring a cinematic storytelling Absolutely. sense and a performance to a song. Yeah. And it's it's really been, it's it's been very freeing to write music aside from a picture, but but kind of, you know, still want to tell a story. So I'm, I'm excited to see where it's going to, going to go next. That's awesome. So where can people get uh, activated, as it were? Activate is, uh, it's on, well, it's, it's on Spotify. Okay. It's on uh, iTunes and, and Amazon and, and uh, CD Baby. 
if they go to thekrprotocol.com, you know, there's links to where they can uh, they can eat both, you know, audition bits of it and and hopefully check it out. The uh, the name, the KR Protocol, of course, people think KR Christopher, my name, you know, my first two initials. But truthfully, what I was thinking of was Project KR from Young Justice with, yes. you know, Connor, Superboy. Yeah, Superboy, and, absolutely. And I was thinking, no matter what music I do, there's always going to be this association, this connection to superheroes. And sure. so the KR Protocol is kind of my bringing in superhero influences into my own my own realm that's really awesome aside from activate is there an, another way that people can support christopher's music career what's the best way people can go and do that oh um just keep listening i mean um in on the film side we have been blessed by so many soundtracks being released by la la land records okay and some of them by water tower music and people are going out there watching movies and going out and, and buying the soundtracks afterwards has really been a, a wonderful support for us and so we're, we're really thrilled that people have done that the kr protocol is is working on it i'm working on a new hopefully album length uh, you know eight to ten song album that's um, great i'm hoping it will come out this year but uh on either the facebook page or instagram or website it's all the kr protocol I'll definitely have news for that so that's that's fantastic uh, be honored for people to, get, to go check it out so to check that out they're going to go to uh the krprotocol.com the krprotocol.com and there there are links there to any social media and it all any news will be on social media channels uh i'm i'm personally on uh both twitter and instagram as utadir u-t-a-d-e-e-r okay and we'd love to connect with people there if they, if they want to reach out are you going to explain that name at all <laughs> Oot a deer you sure um back in like the, the medieval renaissance time yeah they didn't use the word do for like do re mi they actually used oot so it's oot a deer a female deer oh my gosh that's that's really, what it is <laughs> that's very meta that's very meta the, i like the that. obscure meter is like pegging right now <laughs> yeah that's that's cool though that's that's uh that's your own thing i mean what a cool what a cool thing well thank you christopher so much for joining us here on the show today and i'm jazzed to go check out the wonder woman dance music that just sounds like the coolest idea hopefully you'll take some of your own compositions and then turn those into electronic as well right there's a lot of stuff that uh, there's a lot of ideas yeah oh gotta, good you know gotta catalog so we'll see what it what ends up on the dance floor i'm sure. very excited <laughs> to hear that yeah we, we got to get some Superboy themes in there then right that would be the mm-hmm. that'd be like yeah. because of the kr protocol so that only makes yes. sense right i think i it's the, the world is our oyster my friend there you go <laughs> well thanks again so for thank joining you so us. much for, ha- for having me on it's a real pleasure to oh my you. pleasure as well all right well uh, and, and best to you and uh and michael and lolita of course thank you all right bye That was a selection of score from the animated series Justice League, titled Hawkgirl Pleads for Earth, composed by Christopher Carter. That series ran for 52 episodes before it was followed up by Justice League Unlimited for another 39 episodes. He and the other dynamic music partners are currently working on Young Justice Outsiders, which began earlier this month exclusively on the DC Universe streaming service. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Special thanks go out to Christopher Carter once again for joining us here on the show. Thanks so much to all of you listening in live on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed the show, and if you would like to support Stay Tuned and listen anytime, join me over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash philmaki to become a subscriber today. With cool rewards like exclusive interview outtakes, you can also stream this show anytime you like, which means never missing an episode. For more fun, check out my original comic books at RetailSunshine.com and you can interact with me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook under the handles of both Retail Sunshine and Phil Maki. Also, you can keep up to date with the latest animation news by visiting this show at Facebook.com forward slash Stay Tuned Show. I've been Phil Maki, you've been a wonderful audience, and until next time, keep those eyeballs peeled, those ears open, and be sure to stay tuned. Oh boy.
boy, boys and girls, didn't we have fun today? Oh my goodness. Well, you, you have made it to the after party, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the after party. This is a fun uh, part of the show where uh, I just, I pull a Mr. Rogers and I take everything apart. Like he takes off a pair of shoes and puts on a different pair of shoes. And, um, and we talk to you. You, the viewers, about about whatever it is you want to talk about after after our show that we had this evening here. Um, but before we get to that, I would first uh, like to um, thank, I got to do my special thanks to all of my uh, Rubber Hose subscribers. Thank you. 